Hello, good evening. It's about 4 p.m. here. It's a very hot day in Nairobi. These are this is part of the hottest months of the year. We are going to do we are going to define love part two. So what is love or defining love part two? We this one love three parts. The first part will be love as a philosophical ideal. The second part will be love as a choice, and the third part will be love as as a risk or daring greatly in love as you may uh, presume the first part is from the author of the book man's search for meaning victor frank and then the second one is from gary chapman the five love languages and the last one is from the author of daring greatly Brene brown so love we defined last time love from the greek terminology the seven the seven loves, and then we say that in the end, really, they don't really matter which part, which 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 part of love you subscribe to, but you should do them all. And if you're really to love a human being, it must be agape, which is love, which loves for the sake of love or without expectations. There's actually a word which is in English called affectation. Affectation is loving someone with the expectation of getting something back. And then affection being the opposite of affection. Previously, some pastors used to say that the greatest need of women is admiration and affection. While the greatest greatest need of men is... Do I remember? It sounded gross back then. So men need respect, I think. Okay, so love is a choice part one the philosophical idea ideal so in logotherapy which is a form of existential therapy the de- devised or derived from victor frank who was a nazi concentration camp survivor he wrote the book man search for meaning which i recommend if you've not read it i think it's a good book for bad times we are turning to the book for love i hope it won't be <laughs> too big of a surprise. So in logotherapy, love is not interpreted as a mere epiphenomenon of sexual drives and instincts in the sense of the so-called sublimation. Love is as primary a phenomenon as sex. Normally, sex is a mode of expression for love. Sex is justified, even sanctified, as soon as, but only as long as, it is a vehicle of love. Thus, love is not understood as a mere side effect of sex. Rather, sex is a way of expressing the experience of that ultimate togetherness, which is called love. Sex.love is called rape, right? But sex, in the concept of in the context of love, from this physiology, is justified and even sanctified, and it is only to be continued continued as long as this love so that love is only a vehicle towards sex is only a vehicle how does it go love is only a vehicle which necessitates or allows sex to be but not sex as a as a way towards love in fact for the most part for for men who are just out to conquer and women who are out to do the same they usually drop someone as soon as they have sex with them so for the most part, sex is a side effect, really. There was another phrase here, love is a primary phenomenon. So love is not something we don't understand, something we cannot grasp, something we cannot make sense of it. In the past, there was a man called Origen. He came up with something which we now call Origenism, which says that we cannot really understand something unless we go deeper into it. He was a Christian uh, should I say philosopher? So for him, a simple Bible verse such as "In the beginning God created the world" had a deeper meaning, which could not be understood by human beings unless you unless you prayed for it. You know, the father of Cain and Abel was Adam. So imagine you have to pray to understand that. Like, yeah. <clears throat> so paragraph two, a thought transfixed me. So the context here. This, this man, Victor Frank, was 
he had been a war slave to Germany and they, they, they were going to a different camp, they were going to a work site and it was really cold, it was morning and when the it, it was winter, it was cold and when he when someone leaned by him, the man the man whispered, Can you imagine what our wives would think of us now if they saw us this way? And for the next miles of their trek, each man was silent, but they knew what they were thinking about. They were thinking about their their wives. So in that in that transit where they are, they are moving towards they are moving towards the work site, uh, this paragraph comes by. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I understood how a man who has nothing left in this world still may know bliss, be it only for a brief moment, in the contemplation of his beloved. In a position of utter dissolution, when man cannot express himself in positive action, when his only achievement may consist in enduring his sufferings in the right way, an honorable way, in such a position man can, through loving contemplation of his beloved, achieve fulfillment. For the first time in my life, I was able to understand the meaning of the words, the angels are lost in perpetual contem contemplation of an infinite glory. So, <clears throat> love being the ultimate and the highest goal. So this is the philosophical, uh, poetic ideal of love. Love being the the greatest thing which which which, which can happen to man after sliced bread. I don't know why you use that phrase after sliced bread. So. These are men who are in deep suffering, and in that suffering, when they contemplated about their loved ones or their beloved, suddenly their suffering ceased. In fact, in this example, he actually only comes to out of his reverie, so to speak, when the 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 commander, the SS officer of that time, shouts, action or when they shout that the check is over so they should go pick their pick axes and stuff. But immediately he goes back to to making to laying the railroads, his thoughts go back to his wife again. So imagine this that is love. That is love. These are men who used to eat once a day, then drink soup ladled from the bottom for uh, in a few times that but for the most part a really light soup. So this is the first part. The salvation of man is in love. The salvation of man is through love and in love. We know if you if you meet an animal, an abused animal, say a dog, and you love that dog, it's going to change even the skin, even its demeanor. The dog is really going to change. And in the books I've read about children who've been, who've been abused, it usually just takes a very small show of love from someone who is worthy of showing love and these kids might wind up well okay i know there's so many theories which suggest that kids who are abused wind up as miserable people which is true for the most part like what you expect but also there are kids who come from utterly broken families and then they they actually wind up well because 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 of choice first of all we are not slaves to our environment, we are more than we are more than environment. We are more than what happens to us. We are more than where we find ourselves. This is a man choosing to love from a prison camp. From a prison camp. Okay. So how much more is it is it for kids to choose to love despite the 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 shallowest expression of love? So kids who are shown this just the slightest affection are actually going to love actually going to end up well imagine being like it's like being shown 99% hatred and 1% love and they still thrive okay now part two Gary Chapman from the book five languages love is a choice so I think we we can go into this after this series of definitions so 
I found this chapter to be very profound for me. We were coming from explaining the love languages now too. Is it possible to love someone who does not love you? That was the choice. That was, that was the question. Loving the, loving the unlovable or something like that. So you're coming from that. Let's say your spouse abuses you, your spouse beats you up, your spouse does this. I, for, for my admits, it usually seems unbelievable that people can actually forgive a cheating spouse, an adulterous spouse. But it has happened in the past, even in the Bible. So what do you think? Okay. So from that background, now is the paragraph. How can we speak each other's love language when we are full of hurt, anger, and resentment of our past failures? The answer to that question lies in the essential nature of our humanity. We are creatures of choice. That means we have the capacity to make poor choices, which all of us have done. We have spoken critical words and we have done hurtful things. We are not proud of these choices, although they may have seemed justified at the moment. Poor choices in the past don't mean that we must make them in the future. Instead, we can say, I'm sorry. I know I've hurt you, but I would love to make the future different. I'd like to love you in your language. I'd like to meet your needs. I have seen marriages rescued from the brink of, of I've seen marriages rescued from the brink of divorce when couples make their choice to love. So this is profound. Gary Chapman was was a should I say a marriage counselor or somebody who studied love from his from his should I say the people the people used to administer therapy to people he used to do marriage counseling uh, seminars and all that so for 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 close to thirty years he used to counsel married people or people were pe- pe- people were on the brink of divorce for the most part just just as people go just as sick people go to the doctor people go to marriage counselors or to therapy just just plain therapy I usually really at the end, okay, it's hard to find someone who's, who thinks they're okay going to the doctor. In fact, there's a proverb, uh, why would you go to a doctor if you're not sick, okay? So this man knows what happens when there's an absence of love. One, it, people here in Kenya think that um, the idea of, okay, not people, some people or most people of the age of my parents think that these ideas about love languages, about reading books on from the love lab, are usually new ages, you know, a new a new age way of loving. So <clears throat> the question usually is, if 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 these things were true, why is it that marriages last used to last longer in the past than they do now? For which the rebuttal is, back then people used to marry for for the sake of it, you had to get married back then. Nowadays, marriage is a choice. You you can choose to get married or choose not to get married. And in marriage then, people are, people are role mates. The husband brought on the bacon, the wife cooked the bacon, or the husband. Uh, people usually postulated in Africa, uh, people used to hunt and go to war and stuff like that. I come from a warlike community, and what I can tell you is, War was a very rare thing. It was once in a long time, probably once in fifteen years. Okay, what was more common to a, what was more common were, were raids. You you go raid cattle from this community, then they come back raid yours. But wars were very rare. So saying that men used to go to war all the time is is a lie. For the most part, men are just there. They, they used to drink, go to barazas, talk with other men. For the most part, but yeah. They used to rear after cattle and build houses and stuff like that. So, and hunting was was really a supplementary diet. Hunting was not a primary diet. It has never been. It's not sustainable. You can't hunt for food all your life because, I mean, it's the hottest month in Nairobi now, right? So that means even then there were seasons. So there are seasons when when there are wild animals and there are seasons when. They're not there. So, so back then, marriages were 
based on roles. But now, you're not choosing a role mate, you're choosing a soulmate. So a soulmate is someone who has a choice. So what if you can't sustain that love? So in this case now, where people have hurt each other for a long time and marriage is on the brink of a divorce, what Chapman advises is that you can actually choose to love that person. And he came up with the idea of love languages. Love languages, think of a car. A car runs on fuel, on gasoline, on petrol, or on diesel. You can't run that car without without fuel. So you have to put fuel in the tank for that car to move. So there are about five love languages. There's affirmation, words of affirmation, there's physical touch, acts of service, quality time, and uh, I miss one. Affirmation, quality time, acts of service, oh, and receiving gifts. So if, if your spouse primary love language is physical touch, and you come from a, a family where nobody, t- nobody touches each other, you have to learn how to touch your spouse or else their love tank is going to be empty and then you're, they're going to screw you up. Okay, so my primary love language is my, is my, is the way I understand love in the most fluent way, which for me is words of affirmation. My secondary love language is now my spouse's or my girlfriend's or my child's love language, which I have to learn. So if my girlfriend's love language is quality time, I have to love her in her love language, not in mine, okay? If that makes sense, okay? So to finish, it says, love does not erase the past, but it makes the future different. I think that's a good point. Love does not erase the past, but it makes the future different. When we choose active expressions of love in the primary love language of our spouse, we create an emotional climate where we can deal with our past conflicts and failures. Uh, again, I said I've been, I've known girls for quite a while. So if, if there's no sufficient or enabling emotional climate, you're not going to solve a single conflict. Yeah, this, this one communication becomes 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 terrible or impossible so there needs to be some climate first for you to actually address this conflict and this climate only comes when somebody feels loved despite the hurt despite the abuse despite even sometimes infidelity itself if if there's this love then it's possible to address those conflicts of course the best way to 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 deal with conflicts is first of all not to start them but in the event you start conflicts, well, you, you need some you need some backing up of emotional, a sound emotional climate. So love is a choice. You can choose to love just as you can choose to withdraw love. Let's say let's say I loved someone who, let's say I loved a certain YouTuber. Okay, I used to follow their channels, and they begin posting stuff I don't agree with. Over time, I'm going to unsubscribe, maybe delete their videos from my device, stuff like that. So that's, at the first I chose to love the person because of what they did. And then now I choose not to love them because of what they now do. Okay, so love is a choice. You can love, you can love someone who is unlovable. I'm not saying love a psychopath or someone who has a narcissistic personality disorder who is diagnosed by that or with that, but for normal people, which is which is a majority of people, love turns them on. You can get love by by loving them. Okay, <clears throat> now Brene Brown from the Gifts of Imperfection. I actually got this from Daring Greatly, but it was a direct quotation from the book, a first book. So <clears throat> we cultivate love when we allow our most vulnerable and powerful selves to be seen and known. And when we honor the spiritual connection that grows from that offering, we trust, respect, kindness, and affection. So love is a deeply vulnerable thing. I show you what is in me, and you show me what's in you. And maybe if, if we respect that, then this love can grow then. By, by this case, I mean, I think by the people I have loved before, you usually find that people people seem to walk around with some shame which which once you can handle it for them they are freer to love 
And the same way, I have my own fears. If I tell somebody that I fear this and this and this and this, and they're accepting of that, maybe even encouraging, maybe even having soothing words about the same, then they can have more of me, okay? Um, the, the author of this book, Daring Beauty, was explaining to her child uh, how to choose who to tell your stories. So the, there was a teacher in that class who used to have a marble jar in the class which was filled with marbles, okay? So at the first, in the beginning of the semester or the school term, she put the jar in front of the class and then said, whenever the class as a collective makes good choices, we are going to put a marble jar inside the, put a marble inside the jar, okay? When anytime they make any good collective decision, they're going to add more marbles into the jar. And anytime they make a bad decision, they're going to remove the jars from the, they're going to remove the marble from the jar, okay? So think about it that way. You're adding, you're adding marble inside a jar if there's something good done. And then you're pouring out if there's something bad done. So the, the author then found a, a perfect metaphor to use to explain to the child how to choose who to trust. And she said, once you tell a friend something about you, let's say something about your family, and they don't share it with someone else, or they are nice about that, then you 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 add a you add a marble inside your marble jar, which is now a spiritual or, or in your brain, which is unseen. And if they do something bad, you remove the marbles and pour them out. So that's that's vulnerability. That's that's the building blocks of a relationship. Each time somebody does something nice for us, which after what you've told them or after what you've done with them, we, we are putting marble inside the jar. Okay. So we cultivate love when we allow our most vulnerable and powerful selves to be seen and known. So you cannot be loved if you're not known. If 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 what I have here is a facade, how then can you love me? It means you've never really met me in the first place. Yeah. <clears throat> So paragraph two, love is not something we give or get, which is an which is an important point. Love is not something we give or we get. People usually say, if, if if I only meet, if I only find someone to love me, you know, love is not something we give or we get. It is something that we nurture and grow. A connection that can only be cultivated between two people when it exists within each one of them. We can only love others as much as we love ourselves. Okay, so <clears throat> in the Bible or in the books by Joko Willink, the Navy Seal, the advice for being lazy is stop being lazy, <laughs> which which is really funny to me. And the advice in the Bible for, you know, I'm weak and scared and all that is be strong. God doesn't say, I'll, I'll give you strength. He says, be strong, be courageous. Okay, so here we are being told that love is not something you, you really pluck out from somewhere. It's something you, 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 you learn to nurture and grow, okay? I usually think that people who are loved by crowds can really do this thing well. It's not manipulation. It's just knowing what to do. Yeah, some people who can't make a single friend want to be loved by an entire multitude. How does that happen? Okay, then lastly, shame blame, disrespect, betrayal, and the withholding of affection damage the roots from which love grows. We said love is something you, you nurture and grow. So when you shame someone, when you blame someone, when you disrespect them, when you betray them, and when you withhold affection from them, you're, you're destroying the roots of love. Of course, these things happen. You're going to be shamed, you're going to be blamed, disrespected, betrayed by the person you love. But again, he said, when, there's, when the emotional climate is right you can actually accept an apology you probably lost friends by this time someone i can do something to you and you forgive me and somebody can do the same thing to you and you don't forgive them it's because of the emotional climate it's so if i keep hurting you over and over in the same area then that means i probably don't respect you okay so shame blame disrespect betrayal and the withholding of affection damage the roots from which love grows. Love can only survive these injuries if they are acknowledged, 
healed and reared. Okay, so we we will you'll be shamed definitely. <clears throat> you'll be blamed. You'll be disrespected. But if you can if you can acknowledge that you tell your person that you know you 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 told me this yesterday that was really hurtful. That was really that was really thoughtless of you. Okay, and then the the if, if they have any sense, they can apologize to you. If they don't, then it's you just pile up the issues. One day you blow up <laughs> and we jail you. Okay. So let me read this. Shame, blame, disrespect, and bit bit shame, blame, disrespect, betrayal, and the withholding of affection damage the roots from which love grows. Love can only survive these injuries if they're acknowledged, healed, and reared. Okay, so this is the second episode on love so love is love is a choice love is a philosophical ideal and love is an act of daring greatly the person you love can actually decide to work out on you anytime and there's nothing you can do about that and the person you love can actually die you know and there's nothing you can do about that so love is a risk yeah, love is Love is a bold act. You're choosing to entrust your affection to somebody you are not sure they're going to reciprocate that. But it's our only choice. We before if <laughs> before we come up with our own planet, that's all we have. The imperfect human love is all we have. Okay, so we'll do we can do attached attachment styles or love languages in the next videos. Yeah.